Good evening. Once again, welcome to a Good News Wednesday Night Bible Study, where we're spending time in God's Word. Um, and for those that are with us, we're here from 6.30 to 7.15. And we are studying, uh, still the topic of prayer. Um, tonight we will look talk about the Lord's uh, model prayer. But we want to also, before we get into that, even our prayer, we want to let them know that today is December 1st. The start is Advent season that we start looking forward to celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there are many events that go on through this case here. Is that first that um, John the Baptist was born and, um, and then we, I mean, Elizabeth uh, gotten pregnant and then John the Baptist leaped in her womb Then Mary told her and then uh, she conceived. And a lot of events that happened on that we were talking about uh, throughout this month that lead into this. But as we know here in uh, this world that we live in, a materialistic world, that this is the time that many of us, uh, our shopping lists get long, our credit card bill goes up and different things. And I'm not uh, trying to say that this is all wrong in itself. But we want you to remember that Jesus is the reason for the season. And it's all about his birthday. And I think about this as if it's your birthday. You know, I constantly, I thank God for Facebook because on my birthday, I get all the acknowledgments and people talking about it. I don't see them in my mind. They're wishing me happy birthday. Let's do the same this month for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For those that know him, we want to celebrate his birth. For those that don't know, we want to share the good news about him, the reason why he came. He didn't just come, uh, just been born in a baby. He, it says, unto us, uh, a, son. a son was given unto us. <laughs> I can't even think about it, right? It's good. My mind is going blank. For, child, for, for unto us, a child is born, unto, un, unto us, a son is giving. Wow, just see, my mind is going. But listen, there is a great gift that we receive for Jesus Christ, and we let him know why he's coming. Uh, John the Baptist has said, and when his ministry getting started, years later after he's grown, and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which comes to take away the sins of the world. So, what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, about prayer. And before we even get into that, we want to open up Word of Prayer, and then we're going to kind of jump in this because time goes so fast. So we're going to ask that you pray with me, and, and, and for those that uh, have unspoken requests, we know you can always put them in the comment section. But we want to pray for just a safe time during this holiday season. This new um, strain of the uh, Omicron uh, virus and things that are going on. We know our God is able and he's, well, he's sustaining us. So let's continue to trust him. So bow with me in a word of prayer this morning, this evening. Eternal God, our Father, Lord, we come. Just want to thank you and praise you, Lord. And exalt your name because of who you are, Father. You are our God and we're your people, Lord. And we say, hallowed be thy name, Father. Realize that holy you are, Father, and righteous God that you are. And we're sinful people, Father. So we ask you, God, forgive us for the sin that we have done. And, oh God, we thank you for the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, who continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, Lord, we pray, Lord, tonight as we talk about a subject that is dear to your heart and the weakest area of our lives in the time of prayer, Father. We're going to ask that you open us our understanding of Father, and not just be hearers of the word, but doers. And that we would confess, Lord, that it has been a weak area in our life, but we ask in your, as the disciples were asked, Lord, teach us to pray. Help us, O oh God, to understand what prayer really is and what it means to you. And that we'll be kept to give your name, the praise, and the glory. And all God's people said with me, amen, amen. and amen. amen. Lord bless you and keep you. All right, well, tonight we're going to pass the scripture, which is very familiar to all of us, and that is, uh, is coming from the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus had been teaching his disciples. And as he's on the Mount, there's with scribes and Pharisees, and there's a multitude of people around. And he took this time to teach them a lesson. Using the very examples that was around them was those scribes and the Pharisees, who were self-righteous and everything that was external, but they really didn't have a relationship with God. With God. So, and then it comes to the point that he asks us, they wanted to learn how to pray. And Jesus gave them a model of what this prayer is. And it says here, as we read in Matthew 6, verses uh, 9 to 13, and it reads, After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we titled this lesson tonight, as which most of us always call this the Lord's Prayer, but I don't call it the Lord's Model Prayer. And what I say is a model prayer is because if you go back and we'll talk a little bit about this, when we in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had already talked about some of the things that were negative and, and continue. The negative things are pointing in view in the Sermon on the Mount. He warns his disciples and the others that were following him to not be like the scribes and the Pharisees in their prayer life. And it's easy for us all time to come and then get in that same frame of mind. It's not easy to think, you know, we realize because we think, oh, I'm praying this prayer is what? And remember, he told them that they're not to um, use a lot of flattery words or to pray out or to be seen. And But God is looking at the motive of our heart. And so, and this is what we need to realize that. And then I pause and say, I want you to do a self-examination to your own self. You know, why do you pray? Do you pray just to get your needs met? Or do you pray that because... You're trying to enhance your relationship with them. And as we remember, and we're going to talk about this, we're going to break down this prayer tonight. But I, I want you to take it a point and think about God as being your father. And we're going to talk about that and how you address your father. And I know that when we address the subject of talking about fathers, it hits some people negative and some people has a warm feeling in their heart. Because if you have a father who was an absentee father and he was not there for you. He didn't provide for you. He wouldn't listen to you. He was very judgmental or maybe he was uh, just a dictatorian. And then you may have a negative uh, point to, to say and looking at God as your father. But then there's an the opposite. You have a father that loves you dearly and everything that you ask, he met your needs, he cared for you, he uh, just sent you love. So it has a lot to do with how people come into prayer. So, But I want you to realize when we talk about this, we're talking about not just praying and talking to your friend, but God the Father. And we realize that who is the creator and the sustainer of our life. The God that said, let there be light and there was light. We talk about it's the Elohim, uh, the self-existing God, the mighty God. Uh, and that's who we're going to talk about tonight, the El Shaddai. That's the God we want to talk to. And the only way we can really come to him is through Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about that more. Because it's so easy for us as people who don't know. You hear people who don't even know uh, Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior. It's just a prayer they pray. You you go pray. Everybody, even a kid, we've le learned the, what you call the Lord's Prayer. But when you're not doing it the right way, your prayers is not going to be heard. And uh, I always say, you might as well, if you don't know him as your personal Savior, you might as well say, amen, walls, and expect to get an answer. And you will now get it. But James even tells us in here, before we even get into the Lord's Prayer, to show you that there's a right way to wrong prayer. Look what James said in James 4 and verse 3. He says, uh, Ask, ye ask and you receive not, because you ask amit, that you may consume for your lust. And what he's saying here is not that you're not praying, but you're asking, but you're receiving not. In other words, you're wondering why your prayers are not getting answered, because you say you pray, you're asking amiss. In other words, the wrong motive. And the only, that motive is that it may be consumed for your own lust. Now, let me say this, what they said. That's just praying, Lord, to heal my body. Lord, give me this. Lord, bless me on that job. Lord, all these different things here is all about you consume for things that your own desire. Now, and then in that same verse, in, in the second in John 14 and 13, Jesus is telling his disciples that it is a blessing. When you're asking right, there is a benefit when you pray. So that's, there's like a wrong way to pray. There's a right way to pray. And look what it says here in John 14 and 13. And this is Jesus telling his disciples. Uh, he says, and whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do it, that my Father may be glorified in the Son. So in other words, Jesus is saying, anything you ask the Father in my name, he will do it that his Father may glorify. In other words, the, uh, every time you ask something in Jesus' name with the right motive, God will answer. 
Why? Because it's about not you're consuming your love, but the Father will be glorified in the Son, Jesus Christ. And it is for this reason that Jesus encouraged disciples, as well as us today, to change our view of the things of prayer. And this is the reason why. And I'm going to talk about this here because this is a verse here that's paramount that Jesus, before he even taught his disciples all right, the wrong way to pray and the right way to pray, there is a prerequisite to all of us. And, and here it is. In, uh, he says here in the verse that we have, uh, it was um, Matthew uh, 6, uh, 6, was it, 6.33. Then he said, for I say unto you, I mean, it's 520, excuse me, right here. I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, why this is important? He's telling his disciples, you're going to have to be more. They said, except your righteousness, meaning the deeds that you do, the things that you're doing here. See, the scribes and the Pharisees did everything, everything external. The other word, they were legalistic. Their, their thing, they did for people that seemed that they were spiritual. They prayed out loud. They gave their arms so they'd be seen. They prayed out there in the corner because they would be righteous. It was all about them. And he says here, but it said, in other words, unless your righteousness go, is, go beyond just being external things, that it comes from your heart, then he says, you are no case enter the kingdom in heaven. In other words, if your prayers are not in it, your righteousness has to come in your heart. And let me say this here, too. Why? Is that as important? Because all your righteousness and my righteousness, the good deeds that we do, walking people, all the old ladies across the street, helping the poor. And, and during this period of time, there are people feeding the hungry, going to the prison, doing a whole lot of things, being a very good philanthropist, but they don't have the right motives. And he says that, is that what he's saying? It's got to be coming from your heart and you're doing it for the glorifying God. And this is what he's saying. So, and most of us, we have been saying the Lord's Prayer for many years, not knowing that it is uh, it's not only a pattern, but it's approach to the throne of God. That's all here. So it's my objection in this lesson here to show you that Jesus gives us a right way to pray. Yes, like I said, there's a wrong way and there's a right way. And I'm not going to give you a formula for a prayer. It's not what he's saying that you do this and this may make sure it's going to happen. No, he, I'm going to break down this model prayer to show you that you can have a healthy prayer life, whether it's once a day, twice a day, three times a day like Daniel did, and you would know that God hears you. This model prayer can be broken up to in very seven different petitions. The first three is toward God, and the last four is concerning ourselves. And I believe the last four need to be understood if we're going to pray in the right way to God. Now, and before we go on, I want to leave it here for a minute until you will see what I mean when you get this point. I don't want you to get confused. You to realize, oh, if I pray this, means that God's going to hear me. So if you remember the last time I talked about prayer, before last week we did a thing on Thanksgiving, I said there were three things that need to be in your prayer life that Jesus said uh, he used because the Pharisees did them the wrong way, but you would do wrong. First, you need to be a what? A place. There'd be a place. Remember he said, go into your closet. And that, and then you could, uh, and go into privacy, a place to you alone. He said, you pray for him in the silent, he will bless you uh, openly. And then realize it's a privilege for us to pray, right? It's not just something that we have to do. It's a privilege for us to come into the presence of God. And Jesus would clarify this right in his uh, right way in the mode of a prayer. And let me say this here. As I get into this here, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually... Uh, appeal into you to put in the comments there some of the questions that you need about your prayer or a reason why you stagger in your prayer. Why is it hard for us to pray? Why? It's a lot of times, sometimes people try to pray and they fall asleep. Sometimes people pray and they, they just, they're getting, they're doing long prayers and thinking that's going to happen. Hopefully in this here, you understand prayer is not about just your posture, but it's about your heart, your heart condition with God. So, we jump into this, and I kind of way haven't done that, and we probably don't get to it all tonight, but we'll see how far we get. Here, right here, Matthew 6, 9 is where he starts off. And then when he says here, after this manner, now here, this is key, lets us know that this is not something you pray. After this manner, in other words, here is a model, therefore pray ye. 
He's not saying after this manner. It's like, here, here's a, a model for you to use. He didn't say, pray like this, did he? No. Very important. So that's why I said this is uh, just a model prayer that he was teaching his disciples how they ought to approach the throne of God. And he says here that uh, after this, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And this is here, after this here, lets us know that this is not a prayer that uh, is a part of your daily prayer life. He said here, because he says what? After this, right? After this. This is a matter. Don't, not do this here. Here. And uh, the New Living Translation say like this. Pray like this, our Father, that may you know your name be honored. Someone has given this a prayer, a, a cost, acrostics of Acts. And we we'll represent each part. And I wanted to show you here what for those that take a note. And this is acrostic helps us understand when you pray, some things that need to be in your prayer when you're talking to God. Let's look at that and what it means here, right here. The acrostic, the acrostic acts. There's acts right here. And I love that because it gives you something simple that we play. For the A stands for adoration. And the C is for confession. T is for thanksgiving. And the S is supplication. And, and when I say this here, this and this is not in an order which say you say, oh, I need to make sure I do these in an order. Jesus is saying everything that's uh, be in, these here should be in your prayers. Uh, and we're going to talk about this, but they can go in a different uh, motive or different area. But everything here that needed to be is to glorify the Father. Look what he says in, in 1 John 5 and 14. Remember, this is what uh, in the uh, John, St. John that wrote St. John, his John and his epistles, he write this. When we have the right motive in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, you and I, when you pray, you can know God hears your prayers. Here's the condition, he says. And this is the confidence that we have in him. Let me pause from here. This is the confidence that we have. Who is the we? Those that have what? Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that he died on the cross for their sins, and he rose from the grave. And they have not. They believe that, but they also have repented of their sins and have accepted him as their Lord and Savior. As he says in Romans 10 and 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you shall be saved. Once you're saved, and he said, this is the confidence, we, those who belong to him, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now, this is very important here because the only way you can know the will of God is through his what? His word. So when you have a relationship with your father, you're going to read his word. You're going to know his thoughts and you're going to pray his thoughts back to you, which is where Jesus is giving us here in the text and showing us here. That's why I say our father. Everybody can not pray that way. So the first element that we have in the model prayer is adoration. And adoration means an act act of paying homage or to a divine being or to worship. So in the open statement shows that everyone can't pray this prayer. Here, look at verse 9. Here it is right here. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Pause for a moment. Now you say, well, I've been praying this way. I was taught to pray this as a child. You didn't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Uh, here. Hallowed be thy name. Only those who have a relationship, and I can say that a relationship is what? Abiding in Jesus Christ can call him Father. You notice I didn't say just those who accept him as Savior. No, you got to be abide. Remember he said, you abide in me and I abide in you. Without me, you could do nothing. So in other words, that word abiding be means that to be at home, to dwell in. Christ had to dwell in your heart. And you had to, uh, he had to be at home in you and you at home in him. When that is the case, yes, you can know that here because he's the one to create this. Let me say this when he says our father, God is the creator and, and sustainer of all life. But after Adam's sin, everyone is not a part of the sin because the Bible says for what? All is sin and coming short of the glory of God. Because Adam's sin, our relationship with God the father from the beginning was severed. But Jesus Christ, when you accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, now I'm not just believing that who he is, that he was born of a virgin, but you believe that he died on the cross for your sins, 
He rose from the grave. And then you ask him to come in your heart and you repent of your sin. I can see that here. Because in 1 John, then John 1 and 12, and this is a verse that lets you know that you have uh, a relationship with him. Here it is. Look what he said. But as many as what? Receive him. How do you receive him? By what? Faith. Amen. By faith. You receive him. To them gave he the power. That word power is a Greek word. Uh, ekklesia is that what it means, that authority. To become the sons of God, even them that believe in his name. Two things in here. That word, the word receive, that means that you're going to have to receive him. You didn't have to work for it. You didn't have to go out there and be baptized or anything like that. What you have to do is receive him as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Because you do that, he gave you the power. That word power there is another word for authority. You now have the authority to call God your what? Father. Because you become the sons of God. Even as you believe in his name, that word believe is that word that you trusted in him. That's what he's saying. So I believe once you believe and you trust in Jesus Christ, now on the authority, you can call him Father. That alone should give you the boldness and the confidence in prayer. Why? I'm talking to God as my Father. That's why I said it's very important that we understand your relationship. That's the reason why I say sometimes it's people have a bad relationship with God because of their earthly fathers. Well, I want you to see God as your father, as you have accepted him. Amen. It's just like a child can go to his father, you can go to his father. And that's a verse that makes it uh, show this parent relationship at home is very important. Look what it says in Romans 8 and 15. And this is Paul writing to the church there. And he says here, for you have not received the spirit of bondage into fear. In other words, once you have Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, we don't have the spirit of bondage. Amen. God has given us a spirit of, of fear, but of what? power, love, and a sound mind. But then it goes on, he says here, but you have to receive the spirit of adoption. When you accept Jesus Christ, you've been adopted into the family of God. Now, God is your father. And he said, whereby we cry what? Abba, Father. Which is being interpreted as what? My daddy. You can go, when you have received Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you can call him your daddy. Amen. Come on, somebody. If you don't have, uh, that don't get you excited enough that I don't have to have no form and fashion. This is my father. I can come to him. I don't have to pray like the deacons. I don't have to pray like the pastor. I don't have to pray like the prayer warriors. I see them stand up in the church. You can talk to him in a parent or uh, a child relationship and your father hears you. And we're going to talk about when you say him, there's some things that should be in your prayer. Amen. I hope you follow me. If I'm not clear, Write it in the chat box and let me know how I can make it a little more simple for you. Listen how Jesus illustrated this to his disciples in later in the center of the mountain in the 7th chapter, verses 7 to 11. I'm just going to read it so you can just follow with me on the scripture. He says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that acts receive and he that seeketh find it. And to him that knocketh, it shall be open. What man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will give him a serpent? Now here's the key back here. If ye, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father, remember our daddy, who is God the Father, which is in heaven, give you good things to them that asks him. Now, I don't know about you, but that's making it excited. I'm going to walk again with this here. He's here. Look what he's telling. Remember, when you have a relationship with him as your father, your daddy, he said, all you got to do is what? Ask. Right? Then he said, if you ask, you shall what? It's been given unto you. Seek him, and what he will? He'll be fine. Knock, and it will be open unto you. He said, everyone. Now, I like this. All of his child. I love it. I think it's Charles Stanley says, God never says no. He may wait, not right now, or I have something better. I like that because it, you can fit it in this verse here where it said, for everyone that asks is receive it. What? Every one of his child, you ask something, God, you're going you're gonna to receive it. And he that seeks it, find him, not gonna, because he may not give you what you want or what here, but God hears you. Then he says, if you 
of being a sinful person, if your child come in and asks you for something, are you going to give them something bad? How much more would your Heavenly Father give you good things if you only ask Him? That's the reason why we can shout by here. But I want to start here. Now, I, I, I can pause on this and spend a whole lot of time with this because this is where my prayer life is here. Because it's a start with praising and worshiping our Heavenly Father. So, first and the first part of we step, we are addressing Him in adoration as our Father. Amen? The second point is giving the apparition is realizing where your prayer is going. Right? It's not that, you know, the quick style where people always say, the man above, the man upstairs. But our Father who resides in where? In heaven. Amen? It's very important. This statement speaks of the transistent, transistent nature of God. He is exceeding above every limits of his creation. In other words, you're not just coming to uh, uh, the man upstairs, the big man, or some people said uh, the supreme being. I mean, he could be all the things in your mind, but you realize you're addressing God the Father, the creator and sustainer. That um, enough to make you humble yourself. When he says that our Father, then hallowed be your name, you are worshiping him. It should bring you to a place of worship. Arthur Pink, a theologian, writes this and is concerned. I'm just going to read to you. It's not going to be on your screen. But listen to his statement that when he says, which art in heaven, he breaks these words here to clarify these words. He said, which art in heaven should serve as a guide to direct us in our praying. Heaven is a high and exalted place. And we should address ourselves to God as one who is an infinitely above us. It is a place of prospect. And we must picture his holy eyes upon us. It is a place of infallible purity and nothing which defiles or makes a lie can enter there. It is the ferment of his power and we must depend upon him as one whom uh, all might belong. So in other words, when you say our father, you're talking about what? The creator and sustainer of our life, the Elohim, the El Shaddai. Amen. That are our God. Amen. But then it goes to the point where you know, then Yahweh, when we realize that, who he is. But it goes beyond that to the point when you enter to it, prayer is a time of worship. It's not just spouting some word. You, and, and, and let me help you out. When you pray and go into a prayer time, just mean you realizing that I have a privilege to go into the throne room of God to bring you into a humble submission of prayer. That's what you would say. If my people, which what? Call by my name, which what? Humble themselves and pray. Humble, humble yourself. Realize that you, you're his child uh, given a privilege to come into the presence of a holy God. And the only way you're going to come, because it's not on your righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you didn't bring your amen, I brought it to myself. Because of Christ, we can be boldly to the throne of God. And baby, here, even Jesus lifted his eyes toward heaven when he prayed. He said, "Where the, that's where his father is, there will he be also. And he must do his works of his father. Look what he says in Acts um, 1 and 9 through 11. I'm going to read this here. And this is right, remember, talking about this now of the, uh, the ascension of Jesus. When it comes in here, and it says here, and when he was spoken these things after Jesus had died and before he had been taken from the angel in the first chapter, he said, after he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, this is disciple, he was taken up and the cloud received him, what? Out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. What? The holy angels, right? And here's what they said to them looking up. Remember, we're talking about approaching God in prayer in a time of worship. You don't just get up and just bout some words to him. And he said, he, he said, while they were looking steadfastly towards heaven and he went up, two men stood, which he said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into the heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner and ye shall see him in the heaven. Oh, our Father, which is in heaven. That's when you say, which are, our Father, which is in what? In heaven. That's what Jesus is. Amen? Come on, somebody. 
This is what he said. Think about it. When you're there, you're reverencing and honoring him. Remember, prayer is not about just getting your needs met, but it's bringing glory to God our Father. Hallowed be thy name. Once again, let me repeat John 14, 13, because this is a motive for you to pray. Here, and mark this in your Bible and make it a court because uh, sometimes you got to support it. I've heard Dr. McGee say people get upset because God don't answer, but it's conditioned to this. And he says here, and whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that my Father may be glorified. But in that, he said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandment. Just because you're asking God for something, don't even mean to give it. My question is here, do you love God? He said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandment. And this is what he was saying to us. Does that sound like a self-centered prayer? No. Adoration is an act of worship. So when you enter into a time of prayer, most people see prayer as just a grocery list or come in there asking God to do this. But it's actually a time of worship. Amen. And it doesn't stop there. And then he says here in Matthew 6 and 9c, in that same verse in here, Park still talking about, remember the first, the first three is all about God. And he said, hallowed be thy name. Amen. And Matthew, uh, I may, may miss it, but hallowed be thy name. So he said, hallowed be thy name. This is the third point, summation that Jesus is teaching him. That word hollow is a word, we get our Greek word, hagiazo, which means make holy. In other words, when we are praying to our Holy Father, we should be what? Holy. Ah, that's a condition in prayer, right? And 1 Peter, now we get it. 1 Peter 1 and 16, it says here. Here's what here. He said, because it is written, be ye holy for what? I am holy. So to hallow his name means you are to reverence and honor Christ by having a holy life. Now, that's the reason why I said everybody can't pray this prayer. When you're going to come to be in the God in prayer, that's the reason why confession, I say, sometimes needs to go before uh, uh, Thanksgiving and those things. We need to confess, amen, and ask God to forgive us so that we can be holy. And now, he de remember, we have been declared holy by God, but you're going to have to separate yourself from sin, which is why I believe we ought to pray, hallowed be name and honor his name. Confession should take place because sin in our lives, we can't hallow his name. Peter also tells us in 1 Peter 3 and 15, Here's how we do that. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Let me say that. The word sanctify means what? Set apart. Your heart ought to be set apart for the Lord our God. Amen. And when we sanctify our hearts and will, we are living a sanctified life. That's why a confession here is in Matthew 6, 12, and 13. Here's what, here it is come in. Now this is confession. Remember we talking about adoration. I mean, we spare now honor God. Make his name holy. Honor him. He said, we'll say, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Then he says here. Now, here's our confession. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Still part of that prayer. Remember, you don't say forgive us our debts. You got to name your debts. You know, forgive your people. And you you got to forgive folks just as you want them to forgive you. Then he says, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. And I believe it should take place before supplication. We need to deal with our sins. Amen. We would forgive people that have us in our prayer life. Don't, that's what you might say. If you got aught with your brother, leave your gift before the altar and go and get that things right with your brother. Then come to the Lord in prayer. Amen. That's why that acrostic acknowledged by hollering his name, then confession of your sins by asking forgiveness for what you have done and you forgive others. That's a good picture of what it means to hollow thy name is being seen. Now here, look at David said in uh, Psalms 1, uh, Psalm 16, 8. Psalm 16, he says here, I have set the Lord, what? Always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. David said, and he entered in a time of prayer, the Lord is always before him. If the Lord is always before you, that means that you're constantly keeping your heart right with God. You know, it, it talks about it, and uh, we won't uh, spend too much time tonight, but it tells us, uh, I'm just using a, a husband and a wife relationship. And it tells us in, uh, I think it's First Peter 3 and about 7. It says, uh, we don't turn there, but we want to, it says here that you ought to live with your wife according to knowledge, that your prayers may not be hindered. So in other words, a husband and a wife relationship should be in order. In other words, 
husbands, you're praying, asking the Lord to do something. You need to get right with your wife. And the wife, if you're trying to ask God to do something in your life, you need to get things right with your husband. You two need to be in harmony. You can't be, have attitude with each other because he said, if you regard iniquity in your heart, God does not hear you. That's the reason why it's very important. This point reminds us that prayer is not just getting your knees bent. It's all about what? Glorifying the Father. Amen? That's mean, it's not about you. Prayer is not about you. Yeah, there's time for you can get your supplication, but you need the confession to realize, which brings me to the very fourth point of adoration when he says what? Here it is. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is praying for God's plan to be done, not yours. You know what he just said? Lord, my will be done, not yours. He said, no, thy will be done. Where, where at first? On earth, as it is in heaven. In other words, as God is authority, Lord, let your will be done in my life. Amen. It's not about our desires. And we, when we play, it's about God seeking God's kingdom. Amen. His a kingdom agenda, which that all men would come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we ought to pray. Praying for the laws. Praying for this world that we are in here. You know what I say that? Because uh, if you notice the word of God, it said, Jesus is uh, interceding for us. So you guess he's praying for us, so we should be praying for others. Amen? That they would come to know the Lord, uh, the new converts, and the people that are falling by the wayside, the Lord renew them. This all be consumed up in the first of all, that God's will will be done and not ours. Second is praying that his will prevail on the earth as it does in heaven. That's why I didn't say this, and I have to write this to myself. That's the reason why Satan doesn't want to keep us praying. He don't mind you singing. He don't mind you reading your Bible. He doesn't want you to pray. Because when you're praying, you're praying that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when we do that, that means that we're taking power over the enemy. And greater is he is what? In us than he that's in the world. So the fifth point, and as I get ready to close here, it's kind of two in there, and it's not a shift to us. And it's the fifth point, is thanksgiving and supplication. What is thanksgiving? We just finished talking about that. Giving thanks for God to do that. Supplication is asking God for yourself. Amen. So this should go together. Look what it says in Matthew 6, 11 through 13. And I think I will conclude tonight. And it says here, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. The Lord changes the second half of his prayer now. It focuses on to uh, from now, from then, now our personal needs for you and I. What Jesus is telling him is not wrong to ask God for your daily provisions. Amen. Lord, I need a job. Lord, I need my daily food. Lord, I need you to forgive my sin. I need you to protect me from evil. All those are good prayer. But remember, those come after you what? You spend time worshiping God in adoration, hallowing in his name, confession of your sin. Then you thank him for what he have already done. Then you ask him for your need, your daily bread, to forgive you of your sins. Then lead you not temptation, deliver you from the evil. And he will do that. And it's it. And that's because God is all here. This is often our prayer is always about him. But we need to be praying for the kingdom of God. And this represents the S in supplication. Look in 631 and 30, uh, 31 through 30. And I want to read to this as we get ready to close tonight. And he said, Therefore, this is what here. The reason why. You and I don't need to be praying so much to always to our needs, but we know to be praying for this kingdom. We're praying for the lost and those around here. He says here, take, therefore, take no thought saying what you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewith I shall be clothed. All these things do this, these Gentiles see. For your heavenly Father know that you need all these things. But here it is. What is our desire? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things. Think about your prayer life. When you sit down in prayer, are you praying, Lord, bless this here, bless my kids, bless that right here, bless it. When you should be asking by what? Seeking God's kingdom, letting God's will be done in your life, that they be holy, they be righteous, they be saved. Not just, Lord, bless here, bless, give me my job. Lord, give me more money in here. Bless this here. Touch my, heal my body. That's not here. So you want to think, He's not contrary to your physical need. And you can ask for your physical need, but make your priority the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When we pray God the Father and give us our provision, the protection is from evil, it's still glorifying God. Because you know what? This shows that we are totally what? 
dependent on God. There's nothing wrong to pray for the Lord. I, I, my job, but make sure you have spent time about the kingdom first and you're acknowledging God, you reverence him and holy is your name. And then you can ask for these things because God is being glorified. When you come to him, you realize, Lord, I, I can't live without you. And you said you would supply all my what? Needs according to riches and glory. Amen. So I, I, I get what I hear. So this is here. And this is Lord Prayer. It's kind of broken it down to you can understand that now what you need to do. Adoration is acknowledging God, worshiping God. Right? Then thy will be done, thy kingdom come. And then you have to do it. Confession. Confess your sins. When you, after you, uh, you, matter of fact, you may confess your sins as you try, for you can hollow his name. May be holy his name, worshiping him. And then you thank him for forgiving of your sins. Then you can ask him for what you need. I like to close with a remark that Martin Lowe Jones made here. And it's before your screen here. And if you're with me, I want you to read here because it makes so much sense to me that I love it to close on this note. He said, prayer is beyond any question the highest activity of the human soul. Man is at his greatest and highest when he's upon his knees. He comes face to face with God. One more time. Listen to this here. This is why prayer. Remember I started off saying prayer is the air we breathe. If we're not praying, we're not breathing. In other words, our life is stagnant with God. That's why I like Mark Long Jones when he says here, prayer is beyond any question, the highest activity of the human soul. Man is at his greatest and the highest when he is upon his knees. He comes face to face with God. And brothers and sisters, when you come face to face, it will be like uh, Isaiah said, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips living amongst him. And he said, God touched him and cleansed him. So that's what when we come face of God, we don't see other people. We see ourselves for what we are. But you see a holy God who loves you. And he says here, for God so what? Love the world. Then what did he do? He gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believeth, trusted in him, shall have everlasting life. And I'm trying to tell you tonight as I close, as we go into this Advent season, what we realize here is Christmas is all about God sending his son into a sinful world to identify with you and I. So as you get going toward that day we celebrate his birthday, his 25th is not his birthday. It's just a season that we're set to do that. But this is the time we realize God was showing us a love to identify with us. He came in the lowest state he came in a baby. For unto us a child is given, but unto us Unto, unto us a child is born, but for unto us a son is giving. God bless you. God keep you is my prayer. Let us close. Father God, we thank you for this time that we've had to share with your people in a time of prayer. We pray tonight, Father, that something was said that would encourage your people to take it more seriously when it comes time to prayer. And Lord, we realize, even in myself tonight, that I could do better. We all can do better in spending time talking to you, but not only is talking, it's about listening to you, letting your word speak to our heart, Father, so that when we pray, we can pray your thoughts back to you. And we realize, because you said in your word, as we ask anything according to your will, this is the confidence that we have. Because we, you hear it us. Because these are your words, and you will give us the desires of our heart. And I know, Father, your desires, should, our desires should be your desires, because this is your will. We thank you tonight, Father, for those that have heard this tonight and want to continue to have a more healthy prayer life in their relationship with you. We ask that you would do it in the name of our Father, in the name of thy Son, in the name of thy Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. God bless you. God keep you. We thank you for once again spending your Wednesday night with us. We pray that this was encouragement to you. And once again, uh, in this Advent season, do something now letting people know about Jesus Christ because he is the reason for the season. And we want to let you know that there's a couple of questions that we have there. We can answer those for you. Uh, Sister Whitehurst, you're going to go at this time. Is it good to repeatedly pray for the same thing over and over or should we ask only one time? No, it's, it's, uh, you can ask uh, over and over. Now, when I say when you ask over and over, you're coming because remember 
the the parable that Jesus gave about the lady who was kept from coming to the, the unjust judge, and she her persistency kept asking the Lord and asking, and he told her because of her persistency, her persistence, he gave her what he asked for. So I believe the sale and us the same way. God wants us to come back, and here, but it's not praying all the time. I mean, you know, I know I've been taught people say if you keep asking, that mean you're not trusting God. No, that's not the case. You just depended upon it's an urgency. So. Yes, you can pray as often as you want. Just don't let it be vain repetition, saying the same thing and not believe in God. That's what he's talking about. How does one know if they are praying according to the will of God? Well, you pray you know the will of God when you're praying in the Spirit. When he says that when you pray, you pray in the most in the Holy Spirit, not just speaking in tongues, but you're praying in the Spirit, your spirit is praying and you're praying God's word back to him. You know his will. And the only way you know God's will is to know his word. People who pray but don't read God's word, don't spend time in God's word, chances are you may not pray in his will because you don't know what his will is. That's why it's important that we be like it says in uh, John. He says that, that, we, that we, his, we, were, we meditate on his word day and night, and we shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and what shall we do? It shall prosper in its season. That's the reason why you need to do his word. Because Jesus broke bread and gave thanks when he fed thousands of people with only a small amount of food. Is this one of the reasons we should pray before our meals? Uh, yeah, well, I would say that too. And you're giving thanks because we know he's providing uh, our provisions. At the same time, we're asking to bless it because we don't know what is in it. Maybe uh, not proper or anything, something in here. We're asking God if there's something wrong with it to bless it and to sanctify it. So we ask for his blessings upon it. To when we eat our food, yes. And the last one. What can we learn from the prayers that Jesus prayed? He prayed at, at his baptism, when he fed the uh, five thousand at when he fed the five thousand, at his transfiguration, at Lazarus' tomb, before choosing his twelve disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed at the cross. What can we learn from those? Because even because remember, and one of the keys that you wonder that Jesus said is that he didn't come to do his will, but the will of his father that sent him. So the reason why, even though Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, but remember, he became a son. He was come to do his father's will. So he prayed and he showed us and we learned from him. If Jesus being God was dependent on the father, you and I are dependent on God our Father, just as Jesus did. And that's the reason why we can learn that Jesus, we need to pray. If Jesus prayed, you need to pray. And one of the things I've said, a person that doesn't pray is a person that's self-righteous and self-centered because we're thinking that it's all about us. Prayer shows our dependency on God. So I hope these uh, help you in your prayer life. And if you have any other questions about this, you can leave us in the in chat box. Until then, God bless you and God keep you. We want to share with you. We want to continue to uh, share us and like us on Facebook. And we have a, uh, one question. Um, should we uh, end our prayer in Jesus' name? Should we answer? Yes. Remember, the, I, I talked about the scripture. Jesus says that whatever you ask the Father uh, in my name, that will I would do it, that the Father may be glorified. One of the things is not, you're coming not on based on what you did, you're coming through the Father. You're not coming on your own. All that we have is all coming from Jesus Christ. So yes, we need to pray. It's not just a tag on anything. You've got to believe under the authority of Jesus Christ, I'm asking the Father that he may be glorified. So I'll help you with that. Yes, we need to ask in Jesus' name. Okay. All right. God bless you. God keep you. Uh, once again, we remember that our worship service is on in, in place, uh, in service, and we're using CDC rules right now. We're praying for those who have this new Orion virus that's coming on now, that God will keep you safe during this time. But we have an in place of worship and at 9.30, on 8.30 on Sunday mornings until 9.45. So you're welcome to come at 239 West Washington Place. So God bless you and God keep you as my prayer. Have a blessed week. See you Sunday morning.